It yeah. is. Good morning, good morning, members. Good morning. good morning, good morning, good morning. We are ready to get started. And uh, I want to welcome everyone to the Congressional Black Caucus Forum on Police Accountability. I thank everybody for attending today. And let me just go through a little explanation about how we're going to handle today. Um, we had a hearing yesterday in Judiciary. And um, this room is set up to try to accommodate social distancing. We were originally gonna do this in the judiciary room, but um, as we try to figure out how to cope with COVID and maintaining the public health recommendations and social spacing and all of that, uh, it was determined that this room is the best to do that. It also allows us to have video um, with people, with two of our witnesses who won't physically be present today. And so the way we're going to proceed is, is that we're seated up here by order of seniority. So the most senior members are seated up here. The panelists will go through in a traditional manner of speaking. You'll have five minutes each and you'll, you'll notice the timer right there. So we'll stop you uh, at five minutes because we wanna reserve as much time as possible for a conversation with members. And so after the most senior members have asked questions, then they will leave up here one by one as they ask questions. And then in order of seniority, the next members will come up. And so that way everyone will have a chance to ask their questions for five minutes, like we do in normal hearings. And after we have concluded the first panel, we'll move into uh, the second panel using the same method. 
We ask that after you finish speaking, there are covers, microphone covers like this. And at each microphone, there is a bag of covers. And so when you are finished asking your question, you can remove this from your microphone, you can put it in here, the used microphone covers, and then uh, that way we'll, again, be able to maintain the public health protocols. So uh, we are at a historic moment uh, in our country. It's very exciting on one hand, it's quite exhilarating to see all of the movement on an issue that every member of the CBC has worked on for absolutely decades. But I believe that what we saw in Minnesota, the slow, torturous murder of George Floyd by a uniformed police officer and four accomplishments was an outrage, it was a tragedy, and it was an embarrassment, frankly, of our country in front of the whole world. We go around the world promoting human rights, and the world is looking at us and fighting for our human rights around the world. So what we've seen since then is thousands of Americans that reflect the diversity of our nation, a rainbow, marching in the streets to demand justice and call for reforms. It's an inspiration, and it certainly fills me with hope that maybe we will be able to actually have some significant reforms in our country, and maybe some of our more senior members can talk about a time period when we had other opportunities for a significant change in policing. I know in the 10 years I've been here, we've talked about it, but we haven't seen anything happen. But here we are with an opportunity in front of us. Members of Congress, we have an opportunity to examine police practices in America and to legislate reforms to policing practices and to provide communities with opportunities to examine and reshape policing policies in their neighborhoods. It's an opportunity to show the world and to show everybody out protesting that we're listening and that we're gonna act. We all know that uh, too often when a black man or woman is killed by police, the knee-jerk reaction is to question the individual's background. To say, well, we don't know what happened before the camera was turned on. The knee-jerk reaction in reality is to look for reasons for why the individual got what they deserved, which was death. Because it's just too difficult for America to face the fact that racism really is just that brutal. And if you think about it, it's over a hundred years, way over a hundred years, that black folks have been raising this issue, have been marching about this issue, but still in 2020, we find ourselves dealing with the same situation but I am hopeful that it's a moment of inflection for our country and that we'll actually be able to bring about some significant change. I know that uh, everyone knows about the bill that we introduced on Monday, and uh, we weren't gonna really focus on that uh, today, uh, but what we were going to look at in the two panels, the first panel is really looking at policing today, policing in America today, and to hear from our witnesses their thoughts about that. And then the second panel is to talk about beyond policing, because we all know that we could make all the changes in the world to police, but there's other issues that are significant in our community. And I'm, I'm happy to say that in the last Congress, um, CBC developed a major package of bills called Jobs and Justice. And we continue to work on those. And what we hope to do shortly is to reintroduce jobs and justice because we understand that the issues in our community are much broader than policing. And frankly, if you deal with some of the social, health, and economic issues in our community, then there will, really would be less required of policing. If our country, at last, would actually make the investment in our communities. So let me open up the panel today. I want to introduce Connie Rice. Connie Rice is a Los Angeles civil rights, civil liberties attorney, a former member of President Obama's task force on 21st century policing, and she has led the crusade for enlightened, enlightened policing and gang reduction in the Los Angeles area. Our second speaker is Raheem Devon. He is an American singer and songwriter, and Raheem and Wes Felton make up The Crossroads, a social, politically minded, musical collaboration inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement. 
Alicia Garza, who will be by video, is a civil rights activist, writer, and co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement. She's organized around the issues of health, student services and rights, rights for domestic workers, ending police brutality, and anti-racist violence against transgender and gender non-conforming people of color. Darius Bollinger is the founding executive director for Chasing 23 Youth, a nonprofit organization, and he'll be introduced more at length by Robin Kelly, because Representative Kelly, um, Darius is a constituent of Representative Kelly. Uh, and with that, why don't I ask Connie Rice if she would begin, and uh, Ms. Rice, the microphone, you can turn it on right there. You see the green light will light up. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Bass, and for the honor of uh, addressing this esteemed caucus. This caucus leads at a time that is nothing less than the Emmett Till turning point in our 400-year battle to end systemic racism. We are here because George, George Floyd rests in power, the power that propelled a generation so enormously skilled that they took a hashtag and turned it into a multi-international multi movement to make Black Lives Matter. And it also compels acts from Congress. I think that the Justice and Policing Act of 2020 is important for two reasons. It nationalizes standards for the 18,000 police departments, and it invokes the 14th Amendment's protection of African-American rights when state and local power will not. It is an incredible compendium because it looks exactly like our consent decrees. It reads, every, you, you hit every note, you have all other reforms, and um, what it makes me think of is that how come our consent decrees only achieved a reform on the edges, but it didn't end up transforming. I've represented the Rodney Kings and the Serpicos, I've sued police departments, and I've worked very closely with two LAPD chiefs for 16 years. In that time, people have asked me, as people, as an army, an outrage over the Floyd killing, what's changed, Connie? Has anything changed in policing? And I have to say yes, and it's changed for the better. There are standards, there are inspectors general, there are actual investigations now, chokeholds have been banned. A number of police departments have made substantial progress that is seismic in the police world, but it means absolutely nothing in the African American community. The progress that we've made has not protected Eric Garner, Philando Castile, any of the others whose awful murders were captured by videotape. I think that we need to ask the question why. And the reason that the reforms and the progress have not touched the DNA, have not prevented these awful killings in these videotapes, have not changed the conditions of interaction between especially poor African Americans and the police are for three major reasons. Our progress, our work has not managed to end the entrenched warrior culture of impunity that has a praetorian guard in the unions, the police unions. When you see defendant Chauvin pressing his knee and putting his hands in his pocket and looking into the camera, he is saying, I can do this because there is no consequence. That's the culture of impunity. The second reason is that we did not even touch the thin blue line mission that, that licenses search and destroy policing and enforcement and authorizes the us versus them mindset. The third thing that we haven't touched, can't get to the DNA of transforming policing, is that we haven't ended the pathological policies of mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. I call them pathological because if you're an African American man in the Nickerson Gardens housing project in Watts, when you leave your unit on any given day, you face a 45% chance of going to jail. Not a 45% chance of being stopped, that's 100%. You spend, you, if you face a 45% chance of going to jail every time you step outside of your union, that is pathological. It's the, 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 the policies of mass incarceration and mass criminalization that start with the gang databases that criminalize the entire neighborhood and license the kind of search and destroy policing that we see. Until those things are changed, we're only going to end up reforming around the edges. We're not going to be transforming. Precisely because of those factors, we decided that we had to try something new. It's not enough just, we don't want politer, gentler mass incarceration. We don't want to tinker around the edges. 
If you're going to transform police, you have to change the mindset. You have to go from gladiator to guardian. In LAPD, we've done that. There is a solution for, for actually changing how police think, see themselves, and most importantly, how they see a community that, they, that the old shock and awe search and destroy policing only views. It's not a community of human beings. It's a staging ground, a staging ground for getting into SWAT coming in there and doing aggressive tactics that make them look good for SWAT. There is a way to transform the police. The community safety policing is a wraparound safety. It is not enforcement, it is safety. It's done with partners, community partners, agency partners, trauma, teachers. It is a wraparound safety strategy. It is the future of American policing. I understand why people think that it's too late, but we've done it. It's been evaluated by UCLA, and uh, UCLA confirms it builds trust, it's problem solving. The community says that they want this kind of policing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Raheem Devon. Good morning. Good, mo good morning. Uh, thank you to the caucus for allowing us to uh, speak this morning. I'm here um, not only as an artist, but also as an activist. Um, a few years back, I started a foundation called the Love Life Foundation. We've been doing work um, not only in the Washington, D.C. and surrounding areas, but nationally so on the ground um with the help of me touring nationally i've been able to go pretty much to a lot of the inner cities and see um the same turmoil everywhere you know from uh the fact that people are homeless the fact you know fighting domestic violence drug dependency um the lack of resources in the inner city schools and stuff of that nature so i started the foundation a few years back to really just be um, more hands-on and to exercise my voice and to use my platform to bring more awareness uh, to these issues. Um, even having a partnership with the AHF, which is the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, mm -hmm. and um, you know how uh, that's affecting the community. Um, we've, we've fed the homeless here in Washington, D.C. Uh, with the help of my good brother, Tony Lewis Jr., Operation Nourishment, and what have you. and. Uh, the conclusion that, I, that I've come to, that it's definitely more resources and finances need to go into the inner cities, into the schools, um, summer programs, stuff of that nature. You know, in regard to the, uh, in, in regard to the disconnect uh, with, with the police and policing and the community, um, my personal opinion is that they, 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 they have to earn our trust again. It's a, it's a disconnect of trust. Um, you know, and I, I, we've seen it far too many times, you know, of course, before my generation and now, um, the, the senseless killings, uh, the murder of, uh, of innocent people and unarmed people, you know, so I continue to use my platform, you know, uh, as an artist as well, making socially conscious songs for over 20 years, you know, um, at times, you know, we feel like as artists, uh, independent artists and major recording artists, we feel like it falls on deaf ears. But I think that this is definitely our defining moment right now. And um, this is the time that we have to we have to push onward and upward. Uh, I, I think definitely investing in our in our youth um, from a community standpoint, um, you know, we have to also address the, the mental health uh, issue in terms that, that, that comes into play, which is being, um, for me personally, a black man in America, you know, and, be, and being traumatized, you know, when you pull over, when you pulled over by the police, you know, um, I, I too have felt that anxiety, you know, and it, it's it's a real thing, uh, you know. So uh, again, it's no time like the present. This is the defining moment. Um, you know, we have to have policing, but we have to have proper policing. Uh, for the community and that and that trust has to be restored, but also there there's financing that needs to be put directly into the community uh, just in the last two years Turner Elementary in Southeast DC um, I've been part of a program where we you know, we, we deliver fresh fruits and vegetables to the community um, it's, just, it's just on so many levels um, that things need to be repaired and uh, that you know, I'm, I, I, as I, I don't represent the people just as an artist. You know, I don't feel like you have to be Raheem Devon and start a movement, or uh, create a platform and exercise your voice. And uh, you know, that's why I'm here this morning. Thank you very much, Darius Bollinger. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Robin Kelly. Hit the microphone. You see, it? yeah, it should be right there in the middle. Good morning, all my CBC members and all the witnesses, uh, especially thanks for being here. It is my honor to introduce Darius Ballinger. Uh, when I knew what our chair needed, I called someone in Chicago that knows everyone on the ground level and especially knows what a lot of young people are doing. And he recommended Darius. Uh, Darius grew up on the south side of Chicago, had some troubles early on, served time in prison for a felony, but he is one of the people that has changed his life around and not only changed his life around, but his mission is to help other young brothers change their life around also. I teased him. The name of his organization is Chasing 23. Yes, I represent uh, Chicago, but I'm a New Yorker and a Knicks fan, so that 23 part meant Michael <laughs> Jordan to me. Had a little issue with that. <laughs> but he told me it means many things, which he'll uh, share with you guys when he speaks. But right now, I want to introduce Darius Ballinger. Thank you, Congresswoman Kelly, for that introduction. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege and an honor to be here before you today. Um, I serve in a, in a lot of different capacities. Uh, I think right now I come as, a, as an advocate, as a witness. Um, we've seen civil uh, unrest across our world, um, especially across our country. Uh, uh, you can look at a city like Chicago. Um, we've, we've dealt with uh, systemic oppression in a lot of ways. Uh, back in 2013, our city was really sent uh, into a, a spiral with the, the murdering, the, the public lynching of Laquan McDonald. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of trauma that's happening in community right now. Um, and, and I'm just fortunate to, to come on behalf of community. Um, again, my name is Darius Ballinger. I'm the founder and executive director of Chasing 23 of Empowerment Group. It's a mission driven venture to ensure that all Chicago youth have an opportunity to chase their greatness. Um, back in 2013, I, I lost a close friend to gun violence on my birthday. He passed at the age of 23. Um, and before he passed, uh, he really encouraged me to, 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 to push forward in life, to, to redefine uh, status quo and, and societal norms for black men. Uh, he told me to, to chase my greatness, chase my 23. Um, to be all that I could be in, in the world. Um, and when my friend passed, it was, it was a, a, a very pivotal time for me in my life as a father and just as a young black man. And so I started on my road to redemption. Um, and I, I went to college, I studied at under, uh, my undergrad at uh, City Colleges of Chicago and went to UIC to study urban planning. Um, my, I'm the son of a sergeant. My mother served in the military for 10 years. Uh, I believe in, in, in America and this land of opportunity, uh, but through history and through what I've learned is that we do have uh, systems uh, in place that uh, often uh, put profit over people. Um, and through this learning, uh, I find myself as often being a bridge between the have and the have nots, the folks who get it and the folks who don't. Um, and one of my first urban studies courses, we talked about what it means to be in a marginalized community and means to be disenfranchised. Um, a lot of folks in my family didn't talk about uh, government and, and as a way of helping us and a way of understanding us. Uh, we saw police as a, as a means of enforcement. Um, when you're living in a black community, you don't think to call the police uh, because there's a fear of everyone in the community knowing that you talk to the police. Um, and then you have a fear of folks in the community. Uh, so as a, as a black man, oftentimes it feels like first you have to justify your humanity and then you have to advocate for others. I wish that we didn't have to say black lives matter. I wish all lives matter. Because when you say one life matters, that makes other groups feel less than. And I vision a day where nobody feels less than, that humanity matters for everyone. Um, and while I, a group of young people that I stand with um, have, have strong remarks about defunding the police, abolishing the police, and community policing. Um, I believe in first responders. I believe there's a need for public safety. 
I think that what our city is asking, what our constituents are understanding is that when we look at a city budget, it is reflective of those values. And when we spend three times as more on enforcement than we do on educating and supporting, then folks are feeling less than, they're feeling marginalized and they're feeling attacked. So it isn't an outright abolishment of the police, but it's a collaboration with police. I've learned through my studies in urban studies that there are some municipalities and townships that can't afford fire department workers. And now folks from the county and the towns that volunteer to be first responders out of love and compassion. I would like to see something like that modeled at the community level where more of our dollars can be spent towards investigative work and homicidal work and solving systemic problems such as drugs and crimes that come into our community. But there should be a space for residents who people who are fathers and husbands that live in these communities to advocate on behalf of these communities and not have the fear of. I greatly appreciate the work that you're doing. It will take time and time and time again to move our country forward. And while folks are standing in the streets crying for justice, I truly believe that those thoughts are being heard in this moment. And so I support what's happening today and would like to be in support, however, going forward. Thank you very much. Um, our final witness before we begin questions is uh, Alicia Garza, who is by video. Thank you, Chair Person Bass, and thank you to the Congressional Black Caucus for having me here today. In 2013, I co-created the Black Lives Matter Global Network with Patrice and Opal after Trayvon Martin was murdered and his killer was ultimately acquitted. Now I lead the Black Futures Lab and the Black to the Future Action Fund. I started these organizations in 2018 because Black communities deserve to be powerful in every aspect of our lives and politics should be no exception. We deserve what all communities deserve safety, dignity, and power. And yet, this is while this is what our communities deserve, this is not what our communities have received. For decades, our communities have been forced to survive the attacks on us. Education has been defunded, housing has been defunded, healthcare has been defunded, democracy has been defunded. Everything that keeps our communities safe and secure with dignity has been defunded. These attacks on our infrastructure are not just an assault on our safety net, it's an assault on our power. On top of that, policing in our communities is dangerous. In too many instances, those who are sworn to protect and serve our communities are actually terrorizing our communities. And they can do this because the rules are rigged to protect them. Police can act with impunity in our communities because our communities have been defunded because black lives still do not matter in America. Even when we capture this violence on cell phone cameras, powerful police unions help spin the story so that somehow a black person killed themselves. We choked ourselves, we shot ourselves, we hung ourselves, or we somehow did it to ourselves. We are tired of being gaslighted and bullied into accepting what is unacceptable. This kind of violence will not end until and unless we address what keeps us safe. Defunding essential needs in our communities have left gaps in our infrastructure that we now use policing to bridge. Deep cuts in social services mean that police replace social workers and other trained professionals. Gentrification in our communities has decimated our affordable housing stock. So now we have police taking people without homes to jails. We have money to put police in schools, but no money for counselors or teachers, or in some schools in my neighborhoods, books. Police unions are powerful forces shaping government, lobbying for more and more resources and less and less oversight and accountability. This must end, and we need you to be active participants in dismantling what does not serve us. We need you to stand and say that police will not have undue power over our communities, that being a servant means that police will be accountable to the communities that they serve, that police are not above the law, 
and we need you to stand to say that we cannot police our way to safety. For the security of our communities, we must work to meet people's needs, and when we cannot meet them, we must take responsibility for that, rather than handing that responsibility to police to punish. We will not place the responsibility on police to solve that which they are not designed to do. Your colleagues on the other side of the aisle and the occupant in the White House at 1600 Black Lives Matter Plaza will use cheap shots and invest everything that they can in distorting the truth of this moment and the truth of this movement and the reckoning of this country for the crimes it commits, which is long overdue. This is not about some radical proposal to cost any of your colleagues their seats. Defunding is about shifting collective priorities so that the system no longer costs us our lives. As you know, our budgets are moral documents, and it is the reason that the CBC has introduced an alternative budget every year. Budgets reflect and represent our priorities, and they represent what we believe to be important and essential. In cities and states across the country, spending for our needs is being slashed without a second thought. The only exception inside of shrinking budgets from cities to states to Congress is money for police, policing, and the military. My Congresswoman, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, still speaks for me. We cannot continue to bloat the budgets of police and military at the expense of all of us. It is unacceptable and it must change now. I've heard time and time again that defunding bloated military and policing budgets is too radical which is deeply troubling to me because when it comes to defunding our communities, that is not considered a radical idea at all. When Congress moved to defund healthcare, it wasn't a radical idea at all. I have not forgotten how Black Lives Matter was considered too radical, how we were told to change Black Lives Matter to All Lives Matter in order to make people feel more comfortable. Thank God we did not do that. We said what we said, and we will continue saying this and following this as our vision for how we make this country what it promises to be. It is time that Congress, too, now stands. We cannot message test our way to freedom, and if we are more concerned with the message than the mission and the substance, we have failed to show up for this, what this moment calls us to do. For our communities to thrive, we have to curtail the power of policing and militarism. The way that we do that is not just by limiting the scope and size and role of police in our communities, it is also by ensuring real investments in the infrastructure that keeps us safe. The Black Futures Lab conducted the Black Census, which is the largest survey of black communities in America in 155 years. 87% of our respondents said that police killing black people is a major problem in our communities. 83% of our respondents said that excessive force by police officers is a major problem in their community. Our families want to see police held accountable when they commit crimes in our communities. 73% of our survey respondents said that holding police accountable was an important way to improve relationships between police and our communities. Thank you. At the Black to the Future Action Fund, we took what we learned from that survey and we developed a black agenda for 2020. And while our overall agenda, when implemented, will result in safer, whole, and thriving communities, I want to bring your attention to three policy recommendations that we offered Alicia. that are particularly relevant for this conversation. Alicia. Funding state and national data collection yeah. systems that track police stops, use of force data, which I know that this bill calls for, crimes, sentences imposed, diversions, etc., and disaggregating that data by race, ethnicity, and disability. Eliminating law enforcement officers' uh, Bill of Rights legislation, which protects police from transparency and oversight. And finally, redirecting $20 billion for military and war spending into prevention programs that improve community well being and address the root causes of violence. Thank you, Alicia. Behavioral, mental, and physical health services. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll come back during uh, questions and answers, but thank you very much for your uh, comments. We're now going to move into questions, and let me just uh, explain how we're going to proceed, especially for um, those who weren't here at the beginning. Uh, we're set up for social distancing, 
And so everybody up here is seated up here in order of seniority. And so we're going to proceed through Q&A in order of seniority. And when people finish their five minutes, they will then take a seat in the audience and the next group will come forward. Then Everybody has five minutes to answer, to ask or answer questions. Um, and the next group will be uh, Marsha Fudge, Terry Sewell, Robin Kelly, Alma Adams, Brenda Lawrence, Lisa Blunt Rochester. So we will, I'm sorry? Yes, yes, Joyce is gonna chair in a minute. Uh, let me begin by asking Eleanor Holmes Norton. I, w I want to thank all three of these witnesses. This has been very helpful to hear straight from you from different perspectives. Um, I noticed that Mr. Ballinger uh, did say, you know, he believes in police. He sees uh, <laughs> uh, drugs and crime out in the streets, and he's not turning a blind eye to, eye to it. I would have a question uh, for uh, Mr. Devon because he's from D.C. or the D.C. area, and this city poses the dilemma in, 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 in perfect storm. Uh, the District of Columbia, I believe, had the highest rate of homicide uh, in the United States last year and may be on its way to that this year. Now, our mayor was, uh, was quick, and I very much support her in putting Black Lives Matter uh, in, in the streets to make it clear where where our uh, city sits. Um, but the dilemma is, with that homicide rate and the need for police, and if I may, may speak for the poorest people in my district, in Ward 7 and 8, where a lot of that or most of those homicides and crime occur, I, I'm not sure I would hear them saying, uh, we ought to reduce the number of police. I may hear them saying just the opposite. Uh, so could I ask you, uh, given what you know about a city with a high crime and homicide rate, how you would reconcile the excesses of police which we're trying to get rid of and the need for more police, especially in our, uh, uh, our African-American communities and in our communities uh, 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 where uh, uh, lower income communities? I, I, me personally, I, I think that um, when you speak about homelessness, you have to address, when you talk about people being displaced, you have to address um, the cost of living, you have to, you have to address the, the gentrification, you have to address uh, one major factor, mental health standpoint. Um, the fact that you have a lot of uh, you know, people who have mental health issues that are on uh, that, that that are living on the streets. Um, you have veterans that are displaced, living on the streets as well. And I think that like the proper funding going into mental health um, could definitely be very useful. I think that um, in terms of uh, the proper funding for the youth in particular, um, where we're seeing a lot of the violence in the inner cities. Um, you, you know, I, idle time is a devil's workshop. You know, you know what I mean? Like programming, different funding and different things, finding out what their interests are, finding out what their hobbies are. We gotta, you know, as, as the OGs and as the elders, we gotta take the youth under our wing. You know, far too long, it's been a disconnect um, there as well. Um, so you, you would concentrate more pro programming in communities of, of uh, where, where, where there is high crime? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, um, I, I, I feel, I feel, uh, you know, it's, it's to, the, it's, it's to, it's to uh, the proportion of people being homeless now that, the a, that even the AHF, who, who's... Uh, of course, well, it's not the homeless that are committing the crimes in our community. It's, young, it's young black men, yeah. frankly. I understand, yeah. <laughs> but again, in, in terms of people that are displaced, um, it's to the point now where the AHF, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation has even shifted their gears uh, you know, to, to to try to be of service uh, yeah. to those who are homeless and displaced. But as well, far as the, anyway, since my time is running out, do, mm -hmm. do either of the other two panelists 
see the dilemma of some of our communities that have crime, high crime yeah. and, and the call for getting rid of the police and what we as elected officials ought to do to reconcile those two. I think there's two things just to jump in real quick. So being in support of policing, um, there's, the, there's the belief that the one bad apple spoils it but arrest, right? And, and so when we, talk, when we think about police justice, we have to find the bad apples that make it bad for the rest. Um, when I say I support policing, I'm, I'm talking about public safety. I'm talking about the folks that are looking for first responders to come and help out. I, I'm not thinking about the militarized forces that come into communities, that loot communities, that riot communities, that tail communities, right, that, that plant drugs on folks. I think that we have to find the bad apples that both are in community as citizens doing this and within the law enforcement that is doing this. I, I think that the, there's a two things. Policing won't solve violence. I just don't think. Policing will just rise incarceration. It will creep the criminal justice system going. We have to invest into these communities education, health, all of these other things, but specifically as it relates to police. And there are folks that do their job in communities, but there are terrible, terrible people that have several, several, several citations that perpetuate this fear that goes on in the community, that perpetuate the drugs, that perpetuate the crime. And local unions don't go after these folks. We need an oversight. We need someone federally that comes in and says, we're going to clean up your house if you're not going to. That's what I was saying. Did you want to? Oh, uh, let me move on to Bobby Scott. Thank you. Um, a question for um, Connie Rice. And thank you for your lifelong fight for criminal justice reform. Um, can you briefly tell us uh, what qualified immunity is and how it's transformed into something that's really problematic and needs fixing? Oh, okay. Thank you for that question. Qualified immunity says that public servants ought to be able to do their jobs without being able to uh, get pummeled with lawsuits that are frivolous. That's, that was the original concept is that if you're doing your public service in a reasonable fashion, uh, you, shouldn't ha you should have some immunity to lawsuits for carrying out your duties in a reasonable fashion. What has happened is both the, the, the police union infrastructure through the Police Bill of Rights and the courts have made it an ironclad shield that allows murder to be committed almost with impunity. It's turned into a system of impunity because they've made a catch-22 out of the standard. The standard is no longer reasonable. And the standard says for a cop to, to be able to be sued, you have to show that the specific violation that that officer did has been found to be, that violation is a constitutional violation, has to be found by another court before you can establish your violation. As, 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 as defeating qualified immunity. So you come into court with an officer who's done the outrageous things, just, just outrageous behavior, uh, just, just coming in at a party and shooting people up and shooting the cat and then killed, killed, you know, hit a kid. That officer could claim qualified immunity because you couldn't show that that specific fact pattern had been found by a previous court to be a violation. It is... It is part of those infrastructure of, immuni of, of impunity, and um, it's been warped, into, it, it's been um, put on steroids to give police uh, a complete uh, uh, pass. And what can be done to correct it? Well, um, you need to look. I think, I, think, I think the legislation we have would just take away that previous specific precedent problem and put us back to the way I think we were for the last That's right. for about a hundred years. That's right. Will that um, get us to a point where we need to be? Not as far as I'm concerned. Even before, even then, it was, it was too many hurdles to be able to take outrageous behavior and have a court say, yes, you can, put, you can proceed in a case against this officer. I think that what all of us are saying is that there's one set of laws for us and there's one other set of laws for the police. We give them a license to kill, but we don't give them a license to kill with impunity. We give them a license to use force, but we don't give them a license to use force mindlessly, heedlessly, cruelly. Um, I think that a lot of what we're talking about up here 
is getting a policing that gets away from the search and destroy enforcement and goes 180 degrees over to guardian safety that is done in a collaboration with residents. That automatically means what we're talking about in terms of the shifting of the funding. We have failed to solve our systemic problems. We hand them to the police. They will, they will do mass incarceration. So what my colleagues up here are talking about, the investment. Remember the, remember the uh, McComb Commission, 55 years ago, after the 1965 LA riots. That autopsy on that uprising, that rebellion against police abuse, said two things. And I believe it was the Honorable Yvonne Braithwaite Burke who wrote these words, because she won't admit it, but I, I, it sounds like her when she was counsel to the McCone Commission. It said, if you want to stop these uprisings, you have to do two things. You have to fix your police, and you have to end what I believe she wrote, the spiral of despair, the endemic entrenched poverty. The, the, the defunding that my colleagues are talking about. And we've made way too little progress on fixing police, but we've at least made some progress. Thank, we thank have, we have actually organized uh, downward mobility. They, they did a price tag for providing for South LA, the basic infrastructure, $6 billion for banks, grocery stores, credit unions, just the basic infrastructure for a viable community fund viability in a community. Six billion, rebuild LA raised 300 million. Six billion is four defense contracts. Six billion is 3% of the tax gift that we gave to the rich on top of the 14 trillion we funneled over the 40 years to the 1%. So the money's there. We don't ask that question when we're slashing these programs and slashing the safety net. We can fund it, but we have to look at all of the budgets and make this the political will to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Thompson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, for someone who's kind of spent his life trying to make a difference in the South, um, I'm conflicted because part of what I feel is I have to defend the safety and security of my community. And part of that defense is defending people who really don't give a damn about my community. And I'm talking about a lot of people in law enforcement. But I think what we have to look at, consistent with what I've heard from the witnesses, is you have to look at how you recruit people to work for departments. You have to look at the training you provide them in an ongoing fashion. Uh, if they have to qualify annually uh, with their weapon, you know, they need to qualify annually with their mind uh, in terms of the communities they work. Uh, the other thing I look at, uh, some simple thing like residency requirements for people in law enforcement. Um, now, when we started suing people uh, to integrate departments, they all had residency requirements that if you wanted to work for the Jackson, Mississippi Police Department, you had to live in the city of Jackson. Well, over time, that changed because people, Jackson was going from white to black. And so they changed the residency requirements so that that police person could then go to the suburbs, another county, or like in, 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 in Baltimore, another state, and work for the department. So all of a sudden, the officer friendly, the community policing and all that went away because the police showed up every day for work and didn't know anybody in the community. They just, and they'd see a black person and that would ultimately be the person they would attack because in their mind, they were criminals. So for somebody who wants to fix it, uh, and I 
had a terrible, not a terrible argument, a little discussion with my granddaughter because she wants to do away with the whole thing, you know. I mean, just done. And she's 21. And she says she got her own mind. And I said, well, what happens, baby, when you need help? So, well, they ain't coming no way. Said, you know, so uh, I want you all to help me out because I got to go back and, <laughs> and, and, and and clear up my granddaughter's head. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, uh, Darius, you want to yes, give sir. me some words? Yes, sir. I, I, I'm a I'm a husband and a father, and my family are back in Chicago right now. And the first thing, if anything happens, I hope my wife or son would call 911. Um, I feel that. So in, in the city of Chicago, we've had a similar program. Uh, Commissioner Richard Boykin, former Cook County Commissioner Richard Boykin, hopes to incentivize public uh, service first responders to live in a resident, live in a ward where they were policing. Um, I think that, that did one thing. I think it, it put those officers at risk of just being in community and managing, dealing with community. But I, I do think that this was an a effort that didn't get as much progress, but it is something that could be looked into more. Um, the, the, and I think we talked about this too. There's the one side that your, uh, it was your daughter that speaks about that innately believes that the mili that the police are the military and they are sent to enforce. That's the core belief. Um, the other side of it is, is, the, is this poverty stricken aspect that our colleagues was just mentioning, right? That if we don't solve the basic needs of these individuals, they will be more violent. They will be more unrested. The, the, the response that our law enforcement officers will have to deal with will be more uh, aggressive. It, it, it's building up. So we have to be thinking about how are we responding to the livelihoods of these individuals. If these folks have health care, education, if they're finding their, their, their purpose and their passions in life, then that, in, that encounter with law enforcement is a lot different. But again, if, if, if we are starving folks in community, disinvesting in community, and then keeping these folks in community, the job is to keep you here, is going to constantly be this back and forth push. But if we fed those people, nourished those people, built with those people, that's a completely different interaction. But again, there are folks in the, 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 the thing that I saw within this act that doesn't solve for all of the systemic problems that are going on in our community. What I saw the Justice and Policing Act did was add another level of accountability that just doesn't leave it on the city folks to deal with. That was one part of it. Now, I don't think that that solves every other thing, and to the response, we'll have to pull other budgets from other places. But the only thing is, is that we're asking at a national level, because this thing gets sticky at a very, very community, hyper-local level. We can talk really good, but it plays out tough in community. It's for a level of support. So when the officer gets 15, 16 citations and Chicago FOP chooses not to pay attention to it, that somebody in this room has set up legislation in place. That was the first thing I saw. I won't be long. I, I, I'm young. I'm 29 years old, so I'm on that. But when I saw that and I saw the 14 to 15 uh, uh, citations that the officer had in his encounter with George Floyd, I said, well, you know what? This won't happen again in the future. Hopefully that there'll be something in place that will be noticed that. So I, I think, again, that there's two ways to approach how we get to a better future, how we get to a better way of doing things. But as they are in place, we do need a level of support, public safety, law enforcement. We just need the bad apples not to just rotten it for everyone else. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Jackson Lee. Madam Chair, thank you so very much, and uh, thank you again for the richness of our experience and the vitality and the power of the needs and the challenges that we have and the fight that we have. I um, want to take this moment to personally thank uh, the brother of George Floyd yesterday for a stupendous and powerful and piercing testimony that reminded us of the pain that brings us all to this place today. Uh, I um, listened to Mark Morial as well and I proceeded to do my own research to find that more than 4,000 Africans, African Americans, have been lynched uh, in this nation, some not documented, uh, and to acknowledge uh, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice 
in my dear sister's district, which she has shared with Terry Sue, the brilliance of Brian Stevenson, uh, where there are 800 steely, coffin-like fixtures that indicates all of the places uh, where uh, we uh, were lynched. June 19th, for those of us west of the Mississippi, is a day of freedom. Uh, and uh, we have come to know uh, that this president will be in Tulsa, Oklahoma on June 19th. I have tried to, many of us, Danny Davis included, have tried to get everyone to understand the emotional um, task and calling that Juneteenth represents. We will be in Tulsa where the uh, Tulsa community was burned down, the black community was burned down um, some decades ago out of racism. So I think it is important as we frame what we are going to do and what we're doing now uh, and not ignoring that, that very uh, piercing um, element of our history. It is clearly an element of the murder in the streets of George Floyd as this officer need him and ignored the cries of civilians of color and others and thank God for a 17 year old who videotaped this. So I believe that what I'm hearing from the cry of those in the streets and we have to be mentors and elders. Um, I want to thank those uh, brown and black and Asian and white young people who are crying out. I think what I'm hearing is transformational policing, which is what justice and policing does, which is what the original George Flynn bill did called Law Enforcement and Trust and Integrity. And I'm very glad that we are coming to a conclusion that we will name uh, the Justice and Policing Act after George Flynn, and, and we're looking at uh, some additional responses to that as well. There are others who have lost their life. But I want to try to bring the word trust and, and let you answer in the short time that I have. Um, but particularly, and if you can be succinct, because I know I've taken the time, but I wanted to lay the groundwork to Attorney Rice. Um, just the value of restoring civil rights to individuals as it relates to police. I'm just going to ask these questions so that I can get them in. Um, uh, to Mr. Dellinger, I'm going to make sure, um, Bellinger, uh, the idea that in this uh, legislation there are grants to community groups to be involved and there's also uh, the demand for accreditation for the 18,000 police departments that just willy-nilly spring up and nobody knows what the credentials are, what they know how to do and we have that included, how important that is. And uh, my dear brother uh, Devon, um, I come from Trey the Truth and uh, James Prince, Jay Prince, and, and a lot of folk down in the Houston area, you all can be so powerful. And I think it is important uh, as we try to be transformational, how important would it be for police to become guardians when they come to deal with you as opposed to a warrior? So Ms. Rice, if, am I calling, am I saying, forgive me? Uh, yes, I'm so sorry. First and then the three of you, thank you. And thank you all for the brilliance of the members of the Congressional Black Caucus that constructed this legislation. They each have a story. Are you? And, and I think we have enough time for Ms. Rice. Yeah. Thank you for that eloquent question. You have in the, a very important provision in, in the, in the uh, Justice Act, which is the independent investigations of police misconduct. That would begin to not whitewash and bluewash a lot of the abuses. The restoration of civil rights Let's start at the federal level. There is no more mandate. The DOJ is uh, furloughed right now. Uh, there are no more consent decrees. There is no infrastructure for a, a federal accountability to hold police departments. They, they've been given a, they've been given a, 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 a they've just been given a, a go home, do what you want to do. Freedom to do what they want to do. The trust, the model that I talked about is trust policing. It's relationship-based policing. It's safety. It goes 180 degrees away from gladiator to guardian. They call themselves guardians. The community that UCLA PhDs interviewed said, we don't want LAPD, we want community safety partnership police. And that, that, that's the key. These are public housing project residents. They are my clients. They are not saying no police. 
They're saying, stop them from hunting us. Stop them from putting all of our children in prison. Stop the pain. Stop the pain. As Mr. Floyd's brother said so passionately yesterday. Um, there are mechanisms inside this bill. There are also, but you have to change the mission as well. Because you don't want to get better training for mass incarceration policing. Um, you want to get training for trust policing. You have to change the paradigm to safety. Not inf you want enforcement for the rapes and the robberies and, 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 and the shootings. and Let the police do their enforcement stuff for the, for the violent crime. But organize the community to have, to organize around safety, restoration, and investment, which is what all of us are saying up here and what you are saying. Thank you. Uh, Representative Meeks. Thank you. Thank all of you for your testimony here today. Um, let me say I come from New York uh, in a background as a prosecutor as a prosecutor. And as I listen, because I agree with what you have said, the problem that I have is that what we don't take into account and what I think is the root cause of all of this is racism. And we don't address that. Because if it was just a matter of training, you would see people policed in the same way in other communities. Eric Gardner, if he was white and committed the same crime of selling Lucy's, he wouldn't have been treated that way. He was treated that way not because he was poor, not because he was in an area. He was treated that way because he's black. George Floyd, they're alleging, I guess, some check bounced or something. If he was white, he never would have been approached that way. It's racism. I can't recall a time I've been here in this earth for 66 years where I can tell you ever that our communities were properly funded. Schools always underfunded. There was a time in this country when we built it ourselves, and when we built it successfully, they came and burned it down. It's racism that's inherent in everything in this country. As a prosecutor, and I became, I could have done it, I, I wanted to watch because I thought that I could give somebody a break when they needed a break and move forward. But then I saw, because... When you talk about sending folks to jail, it's not just the police. There's a district attorney's office. They're the judges. It's embedded in every system. So when a judge looks down and sees a defendant who committed the same crime, one is black, one is white, the one is white is treated differently than the one is black. So the one is black ends up in jail, and the one that whites get some other kind of program. It's not equal. It's racism. Now, I can't tell you, and I don't know how we eradicate <laughs> this plague, but it is a plague that's on our country that no one wants to talk about. I've been in this place for 22 years, and every year the Congressional Black Caucus has come up with a budget that is really focused on trying to eradicate some of these things. And until now, and this is why I thank all of the young folks that's in the streets to move, it has gone completely on deaf ears. If we get 100 votes, we say we got a lot of votes. And all, most of those hundreds are members of the CBC, members of the CHC, members of the Asian Caucus, and now members of the Native American Caucus. So, I guess I'll ask Ms. Rice, how can the system, the criminal justice system, how do we deal with it to make it so that it is equitable for whether you're black or whether you're white? Thank you. My response is 
This system descends directly from slavery. Containment, suppression, policing, which is the search and destroy enforcement that we see, was done on the plantations. The, pl the slave patrols have the exact same badges that our city police have now. This is a system that was, a, we, this, the system we have descends directly from slavery. Containment suppression is a slave control system. That's the root of the racism. When you talk about the thin blue line, police say we're the, we are the thin blue line between chaos and civilization. What they mean by that is the black community is the chaos. If you're on the right side of the thin blue line, you get respect, safety, and protection. If you're on the wrong side, you get what we see, the devastation of mass incarceration. That is reserved for African-American communities, especially, and even, 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 even when it's done in other communities of color, there is an added level of viciousness when it comes to the African-American community. Um, there's just no doubt about that. The, the way to go after it, I know it's bloodless and it doesn't get to the, to the viciousness and the savagery, the savage inequalities, is to deconstruct the, 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 the structures that hold that and hide that, under, that evil undercurrent, the DNA of this which is racism. Um, everything that we're talking about mutes it, dulls it, deflects it, kind of pushes it into a new arena. But at the heart of it, at the heart of it, is that fundamentally we are not supposed to be here. That we are written out of the script. That 8%, the reason we're more segregated when we move into a neighborhood, Everybody else moves out. There's no doubt. There's no doubt that racism is the driving, the sort of gravity that determines the space fabric of all of this. Um, but I think what we're talking about is the indirect diffusing of that. You're never going to get rid of it entirely. I don't believe you ever get rid of it entirely. I, I, just, I just think it's, it's so deeply a part of our DNA and RNA in this country and around the world. You can go anywhere, you'll find we've exported American racism and French racism from colonialism. On, on that note, um, Barbara Lee, I actually Googled uh, slave patrol badges. You can actually buy them. $20. Oh, I took Chief Bratton to a slave artifact store. Yes, I, I did, I and, never uh, heard that before. To show him that our, our system comes from slavery. He kept saying it came from Sir Robert Peel. I said, I, I lived in London. We don't have bobbies. We have slave policing. <laughs> Barbara Lee, speak for us. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Let me and, just, oh, just one thing I wanted to mention. Remember, Alicia, we can't ask Alicia questions by video, but yeah. we can't ask her questions. Go well, ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for your tremendous leadership. You have truly come for such a time as this. And I want to thank um, all of the members, my colleagues, and our panelists for being here today. And uh, just uh, say a couple of things. Uh, Ms. Rice, um, thank you for framing the context. Uh, uh, I think later we're going to talk about the broader issues, but, you know, I introduced a, a resolution calling for the uh, understanding and, and recognition of the impact of, of slavery as it relates to systemic racism today and how it's manifested in every fabric of our society. So thank you for that. Let me just share uh, uh, text uh, with you for a minute from my son. You know, like all of us here, um, so many black families um, have, have these conversations with our young African-American sons, grandsons, over the years. I come from Oakland, California, uh, home of the Black Panther Party, where the Black Panther Party stood with the community and stood down police violence in the day. During that period, I was having these conversations with my son. The, the trauma that uh, sets in with, with young people is, is, is longstanding and uh, lifelong. He sent me this text. He said, by the way, you can, this is my son, Tony Lee, who many of you know. By the way, uh, you can share a story about me. When I first moved here within 18 months, I was stopped, moved to Los Angeles. I was stopped many times driving while black, but two of those times I was handcuffed twice and put down on concrete. No leg in my neck, 
but I was detained for no reason while smelling concrete. And, and I just share that with you because uh, every member of the Black Caucus, uh, everyone, uh, if you're black, we understand what uh, police brutality means. And we, it's, it's un-American to have to talk to kids each and every day about the dangers they face when they leave their home. And so this thank you all for staying the course. Uh, I want to ask uh, Ms. Garza, who um, is uh, still with us, uh, who I'm very proud of. I, and I want to mention two members here that uh, you may remember, but um, I invited uh, Ms. Garza to be my special guest at the last State of the Union speech when President Obama, when he gave his last State of the Union speech. And it was amazing how members uh, understood, and when they met uh, Ms. Garza, what Black Lives Matter meant. Uh, and initially, I said, you know, we were kind of talking about what the reaction would be, but every member of the Black Caucus thanked me. And they were so uh, supportive and understood and got this and were trying to figure out how to, how to navigate this with our young people. And so, yes, um, Alicia, thank you for staying the course because now the whole world is, is understanding what uh, you and so many young people understood early on, and that's Black Lives Matter. And so I wanted to ask you, Ms. Garza, can you just drill down a little bit more on the uh, issue with regard to defunding? Of course, this administration has defunded all civil rights laws. They've defunded civil rights protections. They've defunded our voting rights. They've defunded everything that would protect African Americans. But could you talk about uh, the 20 billion that you mentioned in terms of redirecting resources and putting resources on the front end so that our communities uh, can be safe uh, and really move forward in a way that uh, makes more sense than to have to constantly be uh, uh, being killed by, by police in, in this next uh, phase of the movement? Yes, Congresswoman, and thank you for asking the question. So the, the, the ask that we made in our agenda is to redirect $20 billion from military and war spending into prevention programs that improve community well-being and that address the root causes of violence, including behavioral, mental, and physical health services, as well as educational, job, and housing opportunities for black communities specifically. Um, and the reason that we did that uh, and the reason that we that we call for that is because we understand that we cannot talk about how to create public safety without actually creating public safety. And we can do a lot to, you know, as 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 others have said, we can do a lot to make policing better. But ultimately, right, if we are not doing a corresponding investment, in communities that have been defunded and disinvested in, then we are not going to be able not only to address the over-policing of our communities that is largely coming into our communities as a result of the lack of the things that we need to live well, but we also won't be able to address, frankly, um, the ways in which we are moving resources in an exponential way um, into a, a system of practices that fundamentally um, we cannot rely upon solely to address safety in our communities. And so for us, when we talk about 20 billion from military and war spending, we are talking about you know, eliminating things like tankers and grenades and rocket launchers and other weapons of war from our communities that we don't need. We are talking about making sure that uh, that the infrastructure investments in our communities actually can serve many, many more people. I want to make sure that we're not using this moment to start talking about funding in small ways, um, programs that will just kind of scratch the surface here. And I think it's important to us that as we are talking about what it means to address racism, in the systems that organize our lives, it means that we have to create parity and equity, and we have to do so investing enough money that it matters. Thank we you. also have to be able to do so, I'm sorry, just one more thing. Okay. We also have to be able to do so in a way that sets standards and has a way to implement those standards and not just leave it to um, this attorney general to implement. 
right? It's very, very important that we uh, make sure that this investment is robust and that it sends a clear message um, that we believe that safety can happen when we invest in our communities and that we believe that public servants have to serve the public. Those are the corresponding messages under that demand, Congresswoman. Thank you. G.K. Butterfield. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me begin by thanking you, Congresswoman Bass, for your incredible leadership. Uh, over the last few weeks, it has been extraordinarily incredible. Thank you very much, thank and you. thank you to, to your staff as well. Uh, to our three witnesses, thank you for getting on the airplane and coming to Washington, D.C. today to, to share your expertise with us. It is, it is very much appreciated. As all of you know, certainly all of my colleagues know, in my prior life, I was a trial judge for 13 years. I was on our state Supreme Court for two years, and so I spent 15 years in a courtroom as a judge and 13 years as a trial lawyer. And so obviously all of my uh, thoughts over the last few weeks have been uh, centered, not all of them, but much of my thought has been centered on uh, the legality of, of uh, police work. I think about the right to bring a 1983 action, uh, which is uh, something that's been in the news quite a bit. I think about the criminal action that takes place from time to time, uh, and I've uh, been trying to, to figure out what we can do to, to make it better. And so I, I'm going to do a little role playing here this morning. I, I hope I don't mess it up. I was telling Greg Mix a minute ago I'm going to turn this into a courtroom. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Rice, I'm going to assume that you are counsel for the plaintiff. Uh, your your client uh, has been shot 32 times he, by the police officer. He stayed in intensive care for two months. Uh, he is 85% permanently disabled, but he continues to be alive. Uh, Mr. Ballinger, I'm going to assume that you are counsel for the city of Trenton. Uh, you're here representing the municipality that this police officer uh, worked for. And Mr. Devon, I'm going to assume that you are the attorney for the cop. Uh, you are the attorney for Paul Wright, uh, who was the bad guy uh, in this situation. And we're going to have a little federal trial uh, for the next few seconds. I never served as a federal judge, and so I've, I've never tried a 1983 case, but I've certainly done a lot of reading on it, particularly over the last three weeks, and a lot of reading about uh, qualified immunity. Uh, and qualified immunity needs to go, but, but counsel? Uh, thank you for coming today, and, and uh, I see your client over there, and, and we are very thankful that he's still alive and able to come to this courtroom and to participate in this proceeding. I have, uh, and my law clerks have been spending a lot of time reviewing your pleadings, and uh, we've, we've looked at the responsive pleadings from, from both sides and uh, read your briefs, very well written. Uh, obviously, you put a lot of time and attention into writing these, these briefs, and just thank you very much for your advocacy. Uh, on the part of plaintiffs who ha who are alleged to uh, to have been wronged uh, by by the police, but counsel, as you well know, I am required by the U.S. Supreme Court to engage in a two-part analysis uh, before you can get relief in this case. Uh, counsel, you've got to establish to this court uh, number one that your client's constitutional right was violated. Uh, you have an, an awesome responsibility to, to present evidence to this court that your client's constitutional rights were in, in fact violated. But counsel, not only that, but you've got to go a step further. You've got to show to me uh, that, uh, that the fact pattern involved in this case uh, is, has been clearly established uh, by another court. Not by the district court, but by the appellate court. Uh, just showing that uh, there has been a similar situation in a district court is not sufficient. Supreme Court says that you've got to show a, an identical, not a similar, but an identical fact pattern uh, from an appellate court. And so I'm just, for the sake of argument, uh, just for the, for the sake of expediting this hearing today, uh, I'm going to assume, I won't find, but I'm going to assume that your client's constitutional rights have been violated. Uh, can you demonstrate to this court very briefly uh, uh, if, if there are any other cases that are similar, that are identical to this in this circuit uh, that can meet the standard of clearly established? Of course, you don't have to answer that, but if, if you want to take a stab at it, you can. Yes. Microphone. We have established a pattern in practice, and we have cases that are similar. 
But All right. Well, I'm going to rule in your favor. I'm going to find <laughs> that uh, that there have been other cases identical to this and, you, and that the fact patterns are clearly established. I'm going to find that there is a constitutional violation here and that your client is entitled uh, to a trial uh, on the evidence in this case. Uh, but um, the city of Trenton is entitled to an immediate appeal before we can have a trial. And that's what I want to get into the record. Uh, anytime there is a finding by a trial judge, I'm out of time, anytime there's a trial, a finding by a trial judge that the officer does not have immunity, the, the governmental body, the officer, is entitled to an immediate appeal before a trial ever takes place. That needs to change, and until law enforcement officers know that there are consequences, both civil and criminal, we will continue to see this bad conduct. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're back. <laughs> you were you were worrying me there for a minute. I thought I'd, <laughs> thought I'd make it interesting. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I want to thank uh, our panelists. I would like to ask you to stay put because we're going to change the uh, members that are up here right now. And if I could ask all the members to take your microphone cover off and the next group of members uh, to come up. Cedric Richmond, Terry Sewell, Joyce Beatty, Robin Kelly, Alma Adams, Brenda Lawrence. I think that's, let's see. Lisa Blunt Rochester and Val Dimmings. Ready? Yes. I guess I'm... We will now start with our second panel again. Uh, let me start by thanking our chairperson, Congresswoman Karen Bass, uh, for opening the session and certainly doing an amazing job. Our first member to ask questions will be the Honorable Cedric Richmond from Louisiana O2. Uh, first of all, let me thank our chairwoman for uh, bringing us together and let me thank the panelists for being here and taking time out of your schedule. Uh, I know that this is a very important issue and I know that each and every one of you are very passionate about it. I'm going to shift the focus a little bit uh, and talk about jobs and justice uh, and how they uh, relate. 
I got into politics because I was a Little League coach and I couldn't get funding for my Little League team. And I got annoyed. And that's why I ran for state rep when I was 25. So with that framing, uh, we can start with uh, Raheem uh, and just talk about uh, the impact of, of jobs, community programs in uh, the neighborhood. And, and one point that Mark Morial made yesterday was that uh, when you first had the first wave of immigration and most of the immigrants were from Europe, if you look at all of the city programs, they were free. Now, uh, if you live in the suburbs and you have means, your kid plays soccer and all that, you can afford it. Uh, but we don't have those programs in the inner city that are funded and available. So why don't we just talk about how jobs and justice intersect? So, Raheem. I mean, again, I said on it, I spoke on it earlier. I feel like idle time is the devil's workshop. I think that giving, you know, giving uh, the youth uh, opportunity to work or trade um, is an opportunity not only to occupy time, but we can't be in two places at one time, um, to possibly get lowered into crime or something of that nature, but it also um, is an opportunity to, to teach um, our youth in particular, who are the future, entrepreneurship and the importance of having your own and creating your own and um, black business and things of these nature. So I think this is, is you know, it's, 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 it's a parallel that we have it, you know, and um, it's very important. Ms. Rice. Critical framing and critical issue. Uh, I would just respectfully uh, I'd like to reframe it to the current COVID mm -hmm. environment. Uh, I think I heard that African-American unemployment is approaching 50%. Mm -hmm. And if you look in the uh, urban areas where it's been 30% for uh, at least the last 40 years, uh, William Julius Wilson talked about the disappearance of work. And I think that has spread beyond the urban core, which was abandoned a long time ago. There have been no jobs. There have been job deserts there for decades, five generations of folks with no jobs. So I'm afraid that that's spreading. And I don't know that we're, our frame of analysis is ready for this tsunami that's coming. I think we have to reimagine work. We have to reimagine what it means not to have work. And what are our systems going to do to meet this new reality? Um, 1992, $6 billion would have given us the infrastructure to actually generate a, a basic economy that would give a certain number of jobs. And it was actually analyzed that way by McKinsey. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what that analysis would look like now, but I would start there because I don't think we're ready for the post-COVID-19 terrain in terms of jobs or anything else. Thank you, and I will add the number that I think they're concerned that 40% of African-American businesses will not uh, exactly. come back. And then Darius. Uh, for sure. Uh, so I'm definitely an advocate for programs. Uh, back when I started my organization, I traditionally started as a nonprofit organization because I had a, a care for service, social service, young people. Um, I've continued to explore the idea of a social enterprise, so operating a, a for-profit business that a nonprofit has equity in. Um, and so that, that model came from Father Greg Boyle, Homeboys Industry, nothing, nothing stops a bullet better than a job. Um, and I do believe in that. Uh, and, and I'm going to be biased as someone who runs programs and sit in that seat. Uh, I, I think uh, the sister Garza, Alicia Garza, spoke of something that, that makes a lot of sense too as well is um, – Jobs are often a means to an end to young people in the community. Um, in the city of Chicago, we have a summer youth employment program that's been happening for the past six or seven summers uh, where young people have six or seven weeks where they come by our print shop, they learn how to print, they learn how to make T-shirts. Um, we really encourage them to think about entrepreneurship. Uh, but those young people that get that $1,200 uh, over those eight weeks, they live in communities where often the family income level is under $10,000. Uh, so oftentimes that little summer check that they get, that goes back into their household within itself. Um, and so the, the, the thing that I often talk about with my young people is that, you know, while, again, this is a means to an end, this is the immediate thing to get you not selling drugs, to not getting you hanging on the corner, is to me, 
I really want to encourage these young people to think a lot further. I wish that they wouldn't just stop at cutting grass and they would say, well, I'm going to go start, start studying law and I'm going to start studying medicine and I'm going to start thinking about a future. Um, I, I think if we, we talk about true justice, we have to solve the issues of poverty that these young people are deeply entrenched in. Um, because while a young person, I can love on him and pull on him all in a matter of eight weeks, uh, that ultimately that $1,200 goes back to helping his family with his bills and his livelihood. Um, and then he goes back into the school year. Has he had a clear, has he or she had a clear uh, vision for their life? Um, and, and so I do think that jobs are helpful. They do allow young people to have clear, career exploration and see a larger vision for their life. Um, but ultimately, if, if, if we are dropping buckets in a larger system of poverty, it, 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 I'm really just putting a Band-Aid on a young person before they come back and it's a full-blown wound. Well, thank you. And I will uh, restate, uh, since I have been in Congress, the Black Caucus has called for a robust national summer jobs program for youth. We still don't have it. Uh, we're going to renew our call for it and push for it. It's in our Jobs and Justice Bill. But... Uh, you're right. Uh, that's how I got my start at working at LSU Dental School because of the mayor's summer jobs program, and we need to keep pushing that. So with that, Madam Chair, woman, I, uh, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. N next, we will have Congresswoman Terry Sewell uh, from the great state of Alabama. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank the Congressional Black Caucus, and I want to thank all of our panelists today. Um, we live in a sobering time. So many of us have been asked by our white colleagues, our white friends, and just white folks on the street, how are you feeling? What can we do? The reality is that we all have a role to play. We in the Congressional Black Caucus have been fighting for years to address the violence that we see and the brutality we see in our policing. And we're finally, finally, I think, reaching an inflection point where we'll do something about it. We have to transform our police. We're hearing that clearly from the voices of those in the streets and from the voices and of the panelists that we hear today. But we also know that power concedes nothing without a demand. Never has, never will. It did so when Frederick Douglass echoed those words in 1850. And we in the African American community have seen it time and time again. Our demand has often been through protest. I represent Alabama's 7th Congressional District. It took the 13 months of, of boycott in Montgomery, Alabama before we got uh, civil, uh, the Supreme Court rule um, desegregation of public transportation. It took 600 protesters being bratted on a bridge in my hometown of Selma, Alabama. John Lewis, our colleague, on the front lines of that beating before we got the Civil Rights, uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Of course, it took the bombing and four little girls losing their lives before we got the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The riots of 68 before we got the Fair Housing Act of 1968. We are in another inflection point, and we owe it to the righteous indignation of young people on the streets, 16, I guess today is 17 days of protest. And I'm proud that the Congressional Black Caucus is leading that effort with the Policing and Justice Act of 2020. But it's just a bill until we get it passed and signed into law. We still have much work to be done. And I talk to my young people in Alabama and I'm asking them, what does success look like for you? You are on the streets with righteous indignation, anger, frustration, rightfully so. And you're telling people like me and my generation that it's time for us to listen. So I wanna do some listening today and I wanna ask our panelists, what does success look like? What is the demand that reaches this moment in history that we are in? We all have a role to play. Ours as federal officials is to affect federal law and policy, and we're trying to do that through the Justice in Policing Act. So I, I want to ask uh, first you, Darius, 
uh, Mr. Bellinger, what does, what does success look like? What does the demand of this protest in this moment, what is success for you? I also would like to ask each of our panelists, so I'm mindful of time. Yeah, I think that there are, I'll say three things and I'll say two things that are in the bill specifically. Um, one, it, it is again, it is transparency as oversight. It is folks, law enforcement won't be able to just do what they do, business as usual without any oversight. Um, the second is a, a, a very specific investment into communities, into the lives of individuals. Again, if we are looking to maintain the poverty stricken, the, the folks that are ill, if, if we are looking to literally, again, suppress these people and keep them in one group, then I understand why we wouldn't point to the lives of these individuals. But if, it, the, if the hope is that we won't be here one day, um, then that significant investment has to be made. I, I think about the work that I do. Um, and, and, and I'm fortunate to do it. Uh, I, I take great pride and, and privilege in being a leader. Uh, but if racism didn't exist in our country, if systemic oppression didn't exist in our country, would I have to do what I have to do? Exactly. To you, um, Raheem, Mr. Devon. I think we need to, um, we, we definitely have to, in, in regards to the police department, you know, Clearly, the 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 people that are wearing wearing the shield, they they should not be wearing it. Like we have to address the fact of racism. There are individuals. I don't know, you know, whether that comes with a psychological evaluation or a more thorough back, background check. Yeah. But we, that definitely needs to. Madam be. Chair, can I ask uh, Ms. Rice to give us one sentence of what she, success looks like for her? You may. When my clients in the housing projects can thrive the way I thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'll reserve my time and go to Congresswoman Robin Kelly from Illinois. Right. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Beatty. And again, thank you, um, Chair of the CBC, Chairwoman Karen Bass. Uh, your leadership has just been outstanding. A couple of things, listening to everyone today and uh, Darius listening to you talk about what people need, it seems like we're really talking about the social determinants of life and closing all the gaps, the wealth gap, the education gap, the job gap, on and on and on. And also I always say nothing stops a bullet like an opportunity. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about which um, conflicts people when they talk about um, you know, the police and what they're not doing, but when you're in trouble, you call the police. But one thing that has happened in Chicago, I'm not as familiar with every place else, the amount of murders and crimes that are not solved in our communities. And that's the other thing that goes toward people not having faith and trust because so many crimes are not solved. Um, yes, that is correct. Uh, I don't, don't quote me on it, but um, our, our homicide clearance rate in the city of Chicago is, is extremely low, nationally low. Um, and so again, if, if, if when folks see a large investment, a $95 million investment in a police academy um, to patrol the streets of poverty and of drugs and of crime, that does not look like a country that loves us, that believes in us, right? If a, if a portion of those officers spent a lot of their time solving crimes, actually getting to the the uh, the horrendous crimes that we see in our com community that that level of trust will be built, um, but there 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 is a strong urban belief and understanding that if you do a crime, if especially if you kill another black man, nobody's coming. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment, but I, I, like I said, I just know Chicago's record is not the greatest, so we need the prevention and the police community relations, but also on the other side, we need crime solved. In Los Angeles, there were 7,000 unsolved murders just in the Southeast Division. That means you can get away with murder. That means the value of those residents' lives is less. It takes trust. Community's not going to trust officers who they see planning evidence and rounding black men up and taking pictures of their tattoos under cleat lights at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
entering every child into a database. We did a case against the gang database. We found two and three-year-olds in the gang database. Um, we have a mass incarceration machine, and it destroys trust, and it destroys the integrity of the criminal justice system. And that leads to unsolved murders, which says to people, you live in chaos, and you don't deserve better. So um, I think the, the opportunity is ending the spiral of despair, but also getting your police to be productive, not destructive, is also a critical piece of this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Because of time, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. She yields back. At this time, we will go to uh, Congresswoman Alma Adams from North Carolina 12. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, let me thank um, our guests for being here. Thank you for what you do. Um, uh, we are all in this together. I really appreciate the opportunity that you've come today and you made your way to, to, to uh, be here. I, I represent uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, as you know, we had a, a killing, a murder in Charlotte a couple of years ago, um, and of course the officers walked free. Uh, I, I have a, and I'm very concerned about um, uh, the the choke holders, the choke holds, and, and all the things that are uh, killing our our black men and women, for that matter. So let me ask, in terms of the, I, I realize that um, uh, the Justice in Policing Act uh, provides funding to uh, community-based organizations to reimagine uh, public safety. Uh, what types of concepts or, or data might be generated by this type of funding, in your opinion? The residents of East LA and Watts, where we created, co-created between police and community, a new system of policing called Community Safety Partnership. They said, we want police who know our names. We want police to do foot patrols. We want police who don't hunt us, but help us. We want police who get promoted for not making arrests, but for diverting children out of the prison pipeline. We want police who look at our children instead of thinking of them as fodder for ComStat and to look tough to get into SWAT so they can shoot them, arrest them, beat them with impunity. We want police who actually look at our children and say, I want this child to thrive. They want police who are part of their community and who help them build their community. They don't want enforcers, they don't want occupiers, they don't want people who slash and burn their communities and put all their male relatives in prison. What they want is they want people who build. And they want people, they want officers who empower them to provide, to co-provide their own safety. The residents do the patrols with the police in the, in the CSP sites. And these are officers, LAPD, never thought I would hear it, I didn't believe it when I heard it. I don't know whether you remember the Dorner matter where the, uh, the, 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 there, were, there was a kill list and an ex-LAPD officer was killing. Gangsters were going down the website and they were saying, yeah, we want him to, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, get him. They got to the captain, an old gang, white gang cop who had taken over the community safety partnership unit and they said, oh no, no, we don't want him. They went, got their guns. Call that LAPD captain and say, we're coming to protect you. Now, I didn't believe I would ever hear about black gangsters wanting to protect anything LAPD. I just didn't believe it. But I went down and I asked them. And they said, yeah, well, don't get it wrong. We still hate PD. But CSP ain't PD. Mm -hmm. They protect my mama. They bought laptops for my children. They make sure that the patrols that get the kids safety and make sure the gangs aren't recruiting in the hallways of the schools. They organize the wraparound programs for summer night lights that keep, us, that keep our kids safe in the summer. I want those cops to survive. Right. That's what it looks like. Okay, thank you. Let me ask, um, uh, I've had a chance to go back and, and take a look at um, the uh, task force, the 21st century um, task force uh, that uh, President Obama uh, put together, and there were certain recommendations that came out of that to really strengthen community policing and trust among law enforcement officers and the communities that they serve. Um, I'm not sure if you've, if you've seen it, uh, but I, I'm curious about what uh, portions of this um, uh, task force um, report, uh, the 21st century task force, which is what it was called, the recommendations do you believe need to be implemented 
um, uh, right now since we're, you know, at this point. So let me ask the young man. Um, okay. I don't uh, think I got a chance to fully look it over um, about the task force, but I'll, again, I'll speak to the idea of community policing yeah, okay. um, and that understanding. Um, I, I do think that, I, again, I, I live in my community. I, I mentor the young people in my community, the residents, the elders of my community. Um, being a, a protector or an ally for my community is it just by de facto, by being there, right? Like just because I'm there. Um, and, and so I think that you have to think about the levels of policing. We look at it in the city of Chicago, we've explored this idea when a lot of crime starts to happen during the evening hours, between maybe hours of eight to four or five o'clock in the morning when traditional programs aren't running. So we have to think about who those folks are, how we're equipping them to do this work. Um, and I do think that there is a is a opportunity for that to explore more. That it may recall a different level of training or a different level of engagement, but there is an opportunity there for mediation. Um, I, I, Again, I, thinking about just the, the inception of law enforcement, um, I think it's just it's just a still it's a hard thing to wrap your mind around. I think uh, our colleague Rice has done a wonderful job of, of talking about that. Um, vagrancy laws were something that were put in place after slavery was abolished. That if you weren't working, you was going to jail and you was going to work for the state. Um, I think that's the same inception, right? That 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 again, uh, we, we see police as enforcing military pushing down um, versus this response to to care for our own places and spaces that we're in. Great, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I believe I'm out of time. Thank you, and I'm just going to remind everybody so we can be on time for our second panel. We're going to do a hard five minutes. Next, it will be Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence from the great state of Michigan, 14. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Um, while it's uh, heartbreaking and mentally, it's hard. Um, I want to ask this question of the panelists. What support from the federal government? Because I'm asked this question all the time. So you pass this one bill for police um, justice and policies to regulate the police. What? What do you expect and what does the community expect from the um, federal government that will empower you to make local changes to our community, to black America, and to our police force? Again, I think accountability is, is you know, holding uh, police accountable for the actions. Um, I think that uh, there's a level of trust that needs to be rebuilt, um, maybe from a community standpoint, in terms of, um, you know, where, where, where certain police officers become, are on a first name basis with um, neighbors and stuff of that nature in the community. I know that's something that um, my elders experienced. There was a time. Uh, where, where that existed, uh, you know, so I think that that, that though, and, and then in addition to other programs, summer programs for the youth, um, you know, just. I, I want to ask both of the, um, the gentlemen who are here because you're young black males. One of the things that I see happening is that there is not an energy for young black males to go into policing. Mm -hmm. Is there any space for us to say one of the improvements or one of the steps we can make is have more people from the community go in to become police officers? Almost every major city, the majority of the police force are white outside of the community. I think that that's something, I think we have to change the narrative. I mean, as, as community leaders, as activists as well, and I think that's it's a stigmatization that's over the community where, where where we look at police as the enemy or if you talk to the police, you snitch or mm -hmm. based upon whatever the, the case is or the information. And I think when that narrative changes, you'll see that, you know. Um, but I think that also, again, um, police have such a, ne a negative stigmatization o over them um, because of these public murders that you know, um, and, and and again, ad ad addressing the systematic racism, um, I, I have I have uh, pretty much darn their family members 
that are uh, police officers, who are black police officers, who experience systematic racism. Um, you hear about it in the military. Mm-hmm. You know, again, again, you have to address the fact that we're talking about um, individuals who are uh, um, white cops who are racist. Yeah. You know, who come from a line of, of, of racists. The, 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 the mamas were racist, the fathers, the grandparents. Generational. Yeah. Mr. So, Berrigan, do you have a comment on that? Yeah. Um, I think that, for one, from my experience, um, just growing up, I, I think that any of my friends or uh, former classmates that, that did join uh, law enforcement, it, one, it was because their father, mother um, were there. So there was some connection to law enforcement outside of the larger narrative. Um, so I think that's one way. Um, outside of that, I, I don't really hear uh, a, a strong desire to be in law enforcement. Um, Do you think that that would be one step that we should be looking at how we encourage our community to stop being a victim and be inside of the system? Um, I don't know. I think that, that that's that's on local local superintendents, local officers to to, to really uh, mitigate that. I think from a from a federal level, from a national level, what certain things does is is it, it puts validity behind it, credibility behind it. Mm. One thing that President Obama's My Brother Keeper initiative did, it, it made folks in philanthropy say, well, we should just invest in black and brown boys programs just cause. Um, and so I, I think that that happens right like at every level there is a um a value set um and, and you know law enforcement has to carry that out but there are local there are local groups that do a good job of uh, of doing it very quickly this uh, rice yes. an excellent excellent topic to bring up i i've represented african-american officers latino officers gay and lesbian officers any discrete minority inside that culture faces a hostile work environment and I think that, that, that a federal framework for addressing that specific sort of a check to do audits of that culture, the culture. There are police departments that are friendlier, mm-hmm. but it has taken a long time before African-American officers felt comfortable. They get pulled over more. You'll notice that the few prosecutions that are done are disproportionately officers of color uh, when, when officers are prosecuted. Um, it's a hostile work environment. And for, Afri- and for women of color in policing, um, my, my female clients just got rototilled. I'm talking in the 80s and, and the 90s. And, um, it, it, it's a, if, you think, if you think about the checks on that, you might get people to think about the profession a little bit more. Thank you, Thank you so much. My time is up. Thank you. Next, we will have Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester, Delaware. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all of the members of the CBC, and a special thank you to the panelists for being here today. I want to follow up on something that uh, Representative Meeks talked about, and it was really the fact that racism is embedded in the fabric of our country. And so when we have these conversations, even though we talk about um, some of our lower wealth communities, this, everybody in this room that is black, has been touched. Whether you are, have the privilege of being an artist and maybe making some money, when you're driving, they don't see how, what your bank account is. So the issues are embedded. And number one, we have to acknowledge it through courageous conversations. We have to act on it because it's not enough to just talk. And there has to be accountability and consequences. Accountability and consequences. And that's why this bill that we put forward is so important, but there are other efforts that we have to make as well. And I want to thank uh, Ms. Garza for both the the message, but also the substance through data and policy, you know, that that your work has has shown. And I wanted to ask um, Mr. Devon and um, also Mr. Ballinger, um, I have an African-American son. I know what it's like as a mother to have to jump up out of your bed when your child is pulled over uh, for a stop sign. And you both, you especially talked about mental health and trauma. And that is the trauma of those everyday things in addition to the trauma of us seeing George Floyd murdered before our very eyes. Can you talk a little bit about mental health? I have a bill that I'm working on right now that will deal with the impact of trauma 
and our account, uh, our connections with policing. Can you talk about, as a black man in particular, both of you, um, about the stigma, about treatment, access, and what you think about just the stress and trauma and mental health? Well, you know, uh, as men, we 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 told we, uh, we we're often told as, as teenagers, as young boys, as you know, men are not supposed to cry and showing a uh, vulnerability. You know, so uh, I think you know I think that definitely plays a hand in it. But again, um, we can't address what we don't have the funding for. Right. We can't address what we don't have. You know, uh, the counselors and the doctors and different classes and courses or or apps, you know, how to deal with certain situations. Um, and it's definitely a conversation that we have to have with our children um, at some point, unfortunately, yeah. you know. Um, and it, so uh, mental health is definitely something across the gamut that we that, that, that needs to be addressed more. I mean, even when you talk about COVID-19, like I, right. I, I don't think it's anybody on the planet that can't say they've been affected um, by this in some it's at some angle due to mental health. You know? Exactly, exactly. Thank you, Mr. Bellinger. Yeah. Um, again, I think we, we talked about it. I think it's hard to talk about racism, especially in a country that had it's embedded across systems. Um, mental health. So what is racism? Racism is the, is the weapon that for the last hundred years has villainized has painted a, a horrible stigma of what it means to be a black man in America. Um, at one point in time, it was hide your kids, hide your wife, they're rapists. Uh, 20 years ago, it was the stuff that they own and the stuff that they drink, and you could shoot them 10 times and they're still going to be alive. They're super predators. And so now in this moment, in order for me to get any sense of justice, any sense of livelihood, I have to, I have to tell you that I cry. I have to tell you that I struggle. I have to fall into a bubble of mental health. Why can't I come right out and say, no, they were very, very explicit about how they wanted to tell our, how, how they wanted to tell our home apart when we stayed in public housing. How the father couldn't, it, we didn't have to dress it up, it, he just couldn't be there. Like, th that's the racism right now, right? And it's not a knock to that mental health bill, but man, it's, I can't even just, because they matter. They just matter. They have to be bipolar. They have to be no. And I and I one thing I like that this bill does, that if you are an officer and you kill somebody in public, it's considered a lynching because it perpetuates fear. It perpetuates fear. So if this so if if, if our government doesn't move, how, how uh, it's being pushed to move after these 17, 18 days of, of protest, it will continue on because it's now it's a blatant sense of we're going to kill in front of everyone to everyone to see. And then we wrap it up in all of these other things. It, it's hard. It's hard. Thank you for sharing that. I have uh, like five seconds left. And um, Ms. Rice, I want to follow up with you afterwards. One of the other bills that I'm working on is the um, civilian review boards and what makes for a strong and effective civilian review board. Thank you so much. And I yield back. Thank you. At this time, we will have Congresswoman Val Demings, Florida 10. Thank you so much. Um, let me say good morning to all of you and also thank our chairwoman, uh, Congresswoman Bass, for her exceptional leadership. I, I really wish we had more time. Um, it has been, it's always good when we have an opportunity to listen and then move forward, um, especially with this situation. It is personal for all of us. It is particularly personal uh, for me. Mr. Bellinger, I so appreciate your definition of racism because regardless of whether it's a Fortune 500 company or the police department or small business, racism has been and continues to be the ghost in the room. Uh, before coming to Congress, I worked as a social worker working with um, families and children who were in trouble. And then I joined the Orlando Police Department. I spent 27 years there and had the honor of serving as the chief of police. I quickly realized as the chief that we could not arrest our way out of many of the issues that we faced in our community, that we had to, we had a direct obligation to address some of the social ills that caused decay in communities in the first place. And so we found ourselves involved in a lot of different things. My focus was on violent crime because I believed whoever you are, 
or the color of your skin, all people deserve to live in safe communities. But we also got involved in housing and jobs and wages and sponsored um, health fairs. And also we started a youth mentoring program for at-risk kids, education. Uh, because of our black boys, I'm the mother of three beautiful, if they heard me use the word beautiful, they'd probably not like it, but three beautiful black sons. And if our black boys don't graduate high school, they certainly don't have an opportunity. And so we sponsored things like GED programs and, and we started a youth mentoring program. And I remember people criticizing me as a chief for doing that. And I would say to them, well, you know, I'm not sure what police work looks like to you, but when my communities are safer and my children are doing better and not being arrested, that sure feels like police work to me. And so improving the quality of life, look, we're going to deal with the police. I've been doing it a long time. And we're going to hold them accountable. We're going to be more transparent. We're going to change the face of our departments because I do believe, I've worked on this a long time, that the police departments should reflect the communities in which they serve. So we continue to need your help to recruit young African-American men and women to serve among the ranks. But I also want to go back to something Ms. Garza talked about. And I want to use the words of former Chief uh, David Brown from Dallas, you all remember, African-American chief. And he said this, that every time society fails, we put it on the cops to solve. Not enough mental health funding, let the cops handle it. Not enough drug treatment facilities, let the cops handle it. In Orange County, we say that the Orange County Jail is the biggest mental health treatment facility and drug treatment facility in the region. Schools fail, give it to the cops. When did we start calling the cops for a child who won't give up her phone in the classroom or stand up and leave the classroom? So, Ms. Garza, I know you talked about deep cuts in social programs and the devastating effects of those deep cuts. And I know you talked about identifying or at least allocating specific funding. What would you suggest is the place where we start? Because we have so many issues, economic development, housing, substandard education. Where would you say we start the process? What's first? Thank you, Congresswoman. My recommendation would be to start in communities and to start, frankly, with jobs. Um, I think that one of the things that we found in the Black Census Project is that over 90% of our respondents said that the thing that keeps them up at night is not police violence, it's low wages that are not enough to support a family. And so if there were an immediate investment to make from a de-investment that we've encouraged, it would be into ensuring economic security. Thank you so very much. Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, we just appreciate your um, contribution to moving forward, moving towards a more perfect union. We have to do that. Thank you all. God bless you. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Next, we have Congressman Stephen Horsford, Nevada 4. I want to thank uh, the Chairwoman uh, for leading uh, this forum today. Our uh, phenomenal uh, chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, Karen Bass, who is not just leading uh, the 55 members of the CBC, but is also leading uh, this legislation uh, on the House Judiciary Committee. This is what democracy looks like. We have an expert panel from entertainment, from research and law, from community-based organizations on the ground informing public policy. This is how it's supposed to work. So I want to thank each of you for taking the time and for helping to inform what is in this legislation and what more has to be done. I just want to say that the root issue that Congressman Meeks talked about of racism is I think the crux of the issue that we do have to address and we do need more discussion, it is not just racism in our police departments. It is racism in every other system, education, housing, healthcare, jobs. And so 
this is the beginning of many steps. But the other thing I want to say is, under because of COVID, our state and local budgets are about to be severely impacted. In my home state of Nevada, we're looking at 30% cuts to our budget. So priorities are going to have to be set. So I'd like to ask each of you, from your perspective, what should the priorities be in that budget? And specifically, Ms. Uh, Rice, I'd like to ask you to uh, answer the question around the role of state attorney generals in helping to oversee local law enforcement. There's a question about can we really trust the Department of Justice right now, especially with William Barr as the attorney general and an administration that continues to incite violence? Who else can we turn to to hold police accountable? So if you can answer that question and then the other three panelists uh, could touch on what the priorities should be. Yes, the state attorneys general uh, can play a substitute role uh, when uh, the feds check out or go on furlough or just AWOL. Um, I assume that was a rhetorical question. Um, it's, it, they, they definitely can step in if the states have the ability to empower the attorney general to oversee local law enforcement and to enforce the standards of constitutional compliance. Um, um, they can do that. They can initiate their own investigations, pursue their own consent decrees. Um, you asked for the priorities. I think it's a jobs and safety. Uh, the first of all, civil rights is the right to safety. The first of all freedoms is freedom from violence. None of the other rights matter if you don't have those two. And uh, not having a job is a kind of violence. Uh, there's, I think this post-COVID frame of analysis, I'm not sure we have a handle on. I don't think anybody has a handle on it right. um, to wrap our minds around what this could be. Um, we're already in a hole. Our community is already in a hole. I don't Thank know you. that we can get out of this hole if, it, if we don't plan for it more robustly. Thank you. Mr. Devon, love your music. What should the priorities be? Accountability and, 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 and a penalty for, like, you know, what, what's the outcome? You know, I, I mean, look at, how many, look at how many cases we've seen where, you know, a police officer has been charged but not found guilty. And then we get the same results. So, you know, you know history repeats itself tenfold until we, until we take charge. I think, and, and there's no time like the defining moment now, um, not just in this country, but globally. The world is watching. The world is our stage right now. The world is watching. Thank you, Ms. Garza. Thank you. I would also again say that economic security is one of the most important priorities, especially during a global pandemic, where we know that uh, not only unemployment is ravaging Black communities under this pandemic, um, but the lack of quality jobs and job standards uh, that help to eliminate and lessen the presence of racial discrimination in the economy is also very important. We know that there's a, a, an overwhelming majority of black workers who, if they are still employed, they are considered to be essential workers. And, and in those industries, right, we have a, a lack of robust uh, job standards that help protect people from wage theft that help protect people uh, from not having health and safety equipment as they are performing essential work. This is what we mean around uh, the ways in which racism permeates every, every aspect of our society and every sector and the ways that sectors are organized. So my priority here would be economic security and subsequent uh, wage standards and job security. Standards. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Mr. Bellinger, I look forward to working with you as well. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I'm pleased to say that we have Deborah Halen joining us from New Mexico One. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you all so much for being here this afternoon. I have felt over the past um, however long it's been since Mr. Floyd uh, suffered that brutal murder in front of all of our eyes um, listening. 
I've had some Facebook Lives and Zoom meetings in my district because I feel uh, compelled to learn as much as I can and actually listen because I feel like that is something that um, doesn't happen enough. So I thank all of you for being here. Um, I think we share somewhat of a similar history. When I was running for this seat, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus endorsed my campaign. At the time, Mr. Meeks was the chair, and in his statement, he, he stated that um, we share similar oppressive histories. Uh, as you know, the reason this country is here is because of the genocide of Native Americans who were on this continent uh, long, long, long before the Europeans got here in the late 1400s. And I have to believe that all of that violence and genocide and murder uh, essentially set the stage for how um, they would treat African Americans uh, when they came here to be slaves. And, and one of the things I get so, um, I feel like so much of the wealth that is um, protected in our country by certain folks. You know, they want to protect the rich folks. They don't want them to be poor. They want to make sure they get all the tax breaks and that all of, all of the wealth stays at the top. Um, I feel like a lot of those, you know, a lot of those folks became rich off the backs of, of so many of all of your people. And I grieve for that every day. I, I truly do. Um, I wanted to just um, talk about very quickly, I don't want to take up too much time. We have a program in my district. It's called the ECHO program. Uh, this uh, Dr. Sanjeev Arora uh, developed this ECHO program. ECHO stands for the Extension for Community Health Care Outcomes. And, uh, he originally wanted to help people in rural communities to overcome diseases. Uh, and so he used, he used telehealth. Uh, he realized that by the time folks were able to come in to actually go to a doctor and address the issues that were, that essentially made them sick and caused their deaths, that they needed to, uh, attend to those much earlier. Um, they have taken that program and, moved it into many areas, and one of those is the ECHO, um, they call it the uh, CIT, Crisis Intervention Team, ECHO program. And I was able to participate with um, these community, this community policing project on the streets of Albuquerque, and rather than uh, call, rather than to take people in to arrest them or take them somewhere, they assess what needs, what their needs are on the street, and they uh, they get folks in there to help them, so that um, we aren't arresting people. And it's it's only downtown in Albuquerque, but I feel like that program has helped, and I applaud it um, because we need other techniques, we need other tools, rather than to just take people into custody and send them to jail and overload our justice systems. Um, those are the ki kinds of programs that I think we truly, we truly need. Um, I, I know that for a very long time, it's been easier just to incarcerate people of color and Black people, yes. Native Americans, yes. The highest rates of incarceration in federal prison with the lowest population rate. That's not by accident, and I understand that. So uh, I just want my colleagues here to know that I am here to support every single thing that you're doing because we absolutely have to do something. And I had one question, and it's for Ms. Garza. Um,